Okay, sound might not work here, so I'm gonna, I'll uh, lose some of my wow factor here. This is a very multimedia uh, presentation. Uh, again, thank you again, Mesh, for the introduction. Um, I listed sort of my biography here. Uh, again, uh, retired military, any retired any military in the audience? Anyone willing to admit to it? Anyone from the NSA? There's some vendors out in there, former NSA folks. They, I didn't get very much. How about high school students? Any students still in the audience? Okay, well, that's not good. Um, now, this talk came about because of my uh, three years in the Army Cyber Institute. Uh, uh, the Army Cyber Institute was my crash course in cybersecurity. Uh, up until then, I was a uh, regular military intelligence officer, so being overseas was great for me. That's where I got to practice a lot of military intelligence stuff. And that's why you see on the slide here the Spice versus Spy. And Mad Magazine fans? All right, we still, still have some Mad Magazine fans. It's great. Um, I'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, but while I was at the Army Cyber Institute, uh, on the first week I was there, we had an Army unit come visit us. Uh, the ACI, we got lots of visitors. And I um, just got, got you some insights into our day, reception day at West Point, where we, as an instructor, I could volunteer as well. So I did that once, and they made me cry as well. No, 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 not, not the second time, the first time. Uh, I did graduate from West Point uh, back in 94, so I went through our day back in 1990, and that was the worst day of my life. Uh, they make you seem... Uh, you can't even tell your left foot from your right foot uh, in the first uh, whole day you're with them. So that's uh, how rough it is a little there. Uh, but uh, in my first week at the Army Cyber Institute, we had an ARB unit come to us and asked us the question, can you simultaneously defend against external hackers as well as internal threats? And so we normally have a bunch of our researchers uh, do a roundtable discussion on this. I wasn't privy to these conversations as I just came to the unit and I was doing my indoctrination training. I had to go back and do my instructor training because I was teaching at West Point. Um, but this is one of the things that sort of stuck in my mind as, because I don't think our organization actually answered that. But so, uh, eight years later, I finally figured it out. I said, here's the talk and I'm not sure if it's going to be used to the organization that's, uh, that asked the question, uh, but here's my attempt to uh, figure out. Now, I used to give a lot of talks uh, when, when I was back in the Army Cyber Institute, uh, and I, I went to a lot of these sides, and these sides in New York, which is very close to West Point, was my very first introduction to this notion of cybersecurity. And he goes, right, someone said B sides. I was thinking record players or records, and that's what he said. Yeah, it's the B sides and all these talks that really don't get into a DEF CON, Black Hat, or whatever uh, A list conference you're looking at. And so, uh, B-Sides New York back in 2017 was my first introduction to this. And really, coming to these talks is gratifying for me because I do a lot of research, I did a lot of research into this notion of disruptive or revolutionary innovations. So before I get into the, right, the title of my talk, uh, what can we do to thwart both internal hackers as well as the external hackers, well, I like to look at innovations first and instead of looking at innovations as one monolith, monolithic entity, I break up into a quadrant. All right? On one axis, what your target users are, and on the other axis, the level of sophistication. And so, with low technological sophistication and with the existing markets, I call that sustaining uh, uh, innovations or meeting existing customer needs. Now, if we move over to the high tech, Right? I call this evolution or Darwinian, Darwinian types of evolution. Now if we jump up, now this is what Igor was talking about this morning. The notion of AI, high tech, uh, high tech innovations to solve problems. I call these breakthrough innovations. And there's uh, a couple of researchers in business school that have coined this term disruptive innovations. The space is in the low tech area but you're targeting new markets. I have renamed it to revolutionary innovations. Um, it still confuses folks, uh, but I think it gives a better sense because I'm using revolutionary in the sense that of its true nature. So if you think of breakthrough, right? If you think Igor's talk about artificial intelligence, right? Are any Star Wars fans here? Right? Yeah, any shirt with Star Wars, I'll grab. 
that's the only reason I come back to these talks, right? Five minute hiatus, I run out of uh, tech t-shirts, so I've been replenished now. So I'm looking at Star Wars, right? These, these breakthrough types of innovation. Um, but the problem is, most people think innovation can only reside in this high tech area, right? Breakthrough or evolutionary innovations. I'm going to argue, especially coming to these talks and B sides, uh, other than Igor's talk this morning, where Igor was saying where all these advanced persistent threats are starting to look into artificial intelligence, possibly for um, uh, hacking, right? US primarily, that's what we're concerned with. Um, I argue that it's this revolutionary space, and even the sustaining space. Evolutionary sustaining space. Uh, a lot of innovations come out of here. And I think that the my talking last one uh, for this conference, I think we'll hopefully reaffirm that to uh, most of the talkers here and then really for the audience that will be sitting through these talks. And really, when I'm talking about revolutionary innovations, I'm talking truly revolutions. Like, so if you're thinking about Ryan right now, right, the issues with the burqa and this lady doesn't decide not to wear, that is a revolution. She has no power, right? She died, right? The police probably uh, beat her in the head. She died of brain tumor or brain hemorrhaging. But that's a revolution. That's dangerous stuff. So if we think about George Washington, that was dangerous stuff, right? We, he and his man, uh, in this case, uh, the 50, 50 folks who signed their name on the Bill of Declarations, right? That, that's, that's revolution. They signed their names and really had death born on them. So it's, it's a dangerous space. Revolutionary space is dangerous. And that's why I want folks to keep in mind. Now, the innovations I'm talking about, really, can there really be innovation in this low tech field? You know, Every talk I've heard today, other than a keynote, keynote talk on AI, every talk I've heard today has been in the space, right? Every talk, every speaker who's come up here, and I've only seen half the talks, but every speaker who's been up here, um, Vincent, Dale, Grant, uh, they're talking, right? They're telling you the not only is the penetration low tech, right? It's not that sophisticated. The folks are giving the solution, the Dales, right? The folks are giving Rob and Rodney's. They're giving the solutions. They're giving you low-tech, right, solutions to how to thwart those vulnerabilities. And really, uh, when I taught at West Point, I always like to give analogies. And so for me, the best way to give analogies uh, is via Hollywood. Uh, I grew up watching a lot of TV. Uh, when I grew up, they used to give uh, a questionnaire, I think it was back in fourth grade, how many hours of TV you watched. Uh, my scale was not reflected on the questions. I think it was two hours, four hours, six hours. I was close to the eight to ten hours a day uh, TV. So I would go home, watch uh, General Hospital, the end of General Hospital, right? This is how the uh, soap operas that were uh, closing up the day, go to the divorce court, uh, yeah, this is, and then start the the uh, cartoon, right? Cartoon from three to six. Then I go to three's company, right? So when did he eat dinner? Uh, well, uh, I think I turned over, right? So, but I like to use analogies in order to get these points across. So for me, Spock is the quintessential sustaining type of internet. He's giving Captain Kirk an entire enterprise, right? The most logical, highest probability of success types of options. And so for me, Spock is it, right? Star, Star Trek fans. Uh, I'm a Star Wars, Star Trek fan? Yeah, Star Wars fan here, I'm also a Star Trek fan. Like, I love to tell these conferences because everyone's either Star Trek, Star Wars fan. Now, evolutionary, I already brought this notion of, of spy versus spy. And so it's really, in the evolutionary space, all you want to do is one-up your, your next best competitor. So we're thinking of Coke, Pepsi, um, even the big three, right? General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, some of those. If you're just trying to one-up your next best competitor. Now breakthrough, right? Breakthrough, right? It's, it's James Bond, and particularly the Pierce Brosnan of James Bond. So if you're thinking Daniel Craig, yeah, in Casino Royale when they did the remake, he's sort of not really high tech. He was doing more of his uh, uh, action, right? Fighting off with not the gadgets, but with his fists and what he had. But really, for the Pierce Brosnan James Bond, he had all the high tech issues. And Q, the right, the core master of division, gave him all the gadgets he needed. To see the world. Now, on the revolutionary side, uh, yeah, we don't have too many high school students here, so we all, you know, we all know that, right? Who's that? That's who's that? MacGyver, MacGyver right? So we're on the revolutionary side for spies. 
is MacGyver. He's got his Swiss Army knife, right, the rubber band in his pocket, the chewing gum, pencil. Uh, and that's what he's saving. And that contrasts starkly with James Bond. Now, again, now if we, we had high school students, this is what I like, right? Yeah, so we have Jason Bourne, right? Jason Bourne, he's doing uh, everything. He's trying to save the day. Because he can't remember, right? He can't remember. So he's saving the day with whatever he's got in his pocket, right? He's driving the mini, mini coupe, the old one, he leans to the left, right? So he's trying to save the day with, with what he's got at his disposal. Now, the one I really like is Michael Weston. Any burn notice fans? Burn notice. Right? So, because really, it's in the it's in the opening opening sequence, right? When you've been burned, you got nothing, no cash, no credit, no job history. So Michael Weston is saving the day. Fortunately, he's got lots of friends who have lots of neat tools and uh, lots of toys. Uh, but he's right. He's resorting to uh, friends, family. That's what it is. Now, one of these doesn't fit on the screen, right? As much as I like Star Trek. Spot really doesn't fit in my analogies because all these I'm talking about Spock. Right? So I've got to throw Spock out, right? It just doesn't fit. Now I am going to throw Spock out, but yeah, if I had sound, you'd hear the Mission Impossible theme song going on. I'm not talking about Tom Cruise Mission Impossible because Tom Cruise Mission Impossible, right? He's up in the breakthrough as well. Even in, in uh, Ghost Protocol when they were essentially disavowed, right? The secretary was killed, they were disavowed. They still had a train full of all this high-tech stuff. So, so Tom Cruise's Mission Impossible is still a breakthrough. He's got all the toys. Yeah, they fail sometimes, but he's got the toys. So I'm not thinking of the Tom Cruise Mission Impossible. I'm thinking of the original Mission Impossible where Larry Nimoy played Paris. And not only was it Paris that resigned in that space, it's really the entire IMF force, right? The Impossible Mission Forces. Uh, I'm watching series one uh, as I was prepping for this brief, and I've got my eight-year-old nephew hooked on it now. Uh, so he's watching all these old Mission Impossible episodes. He said, I want to watch the next one. I've, been, I've allowed him to break curfew twice to watch <laughs> Mission Impossible episodes. And so in this space, right, all these folks are really actors, playing actors that call these governments into doing something you know, that the U.S. government wants to do. Uh, I watched uh, the third episode of the first season. Uh, they actually tell you the U.S. IMF forces are not sanctioned to do assassinations, but what they do is they convince this rogue nation that one of their spies is informing on them, and they execute <laughs> that, that guy in the end. Uh, so. Now, there is one person in the original missions force who is in the breakthrough. That's Barney, right? He's always introducing the... Um, Video recorders, tape recorders, all the high tech stuff. And again, they, they don't always work. And that's one of the nice things with uh, Mission Impossible. Right? They don't sort of rely on the space itself. And it goes to the revolutionary space as well, right? So a lot of improvisation, improvisation goes on. Now, there is one Tom Cruise movie where he does uh, get to play sort of a revolutionary hero, at least, at least. Uh, portray revolutionary innovation in a positive way. Can anyone remember or think of that movie? Now, I don't have the music here, but hopefully the opening sequence will give enough. Oh, I think I broke it, sorry. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Just a flicker. So it's still playing. Uh, now it's not it's not Top Gun 2, right? It's still on theater. It's not Top Gun 2. I'll kill him Gillis for it. It's it's Top Gun 1. Right, the first Top Gun. And here's the interesting thing. If I didn't see this, I, this is amazing. What it says right here. Yes, yeah, so I'd sort of blow it up a little more. So it says on March 3rd, 1969, the U.S. Navy established an elite school for the top 1% of its pilots. And its purpose was to teach them the lost art of dogfighting or aerial combat. And the interesting thing is that prior to the establishment of Top Gun, the the kill ratio 
of US pilots to Russian pilots or down uh, uh, down uh, MiG-17s, MiG-21s to down F4, F8s was two to one. Uh, yeah, the ratio sounds bad. It was really about 50 US air, aircraft uh, fighter pilots that down, uh, fighter jets that had been down to about 100 of those uh, MiG-21s, MiG-17s. Um, but from the perspective of the US military, uh, who had very good success in Korean War, the, the ratios were closer to 16 to 1, uh, they thought of this as a disaster. And so the Navy went a decidedly different way than the Air Force uh, in order to, to combat or rectify this remedy, this problem. And so the Navy went with Top Gun. And the Air Force, they had their own version of Top Gun, which is at Manila's Air Force Base, but it really didn't introduce the notion of dogfighting. It just perpetuated the continuation of, of what they had already done. So it, was, it wasn't really much change. And here's the ratio that came after, right? Really, one year after, and this is amazing. Top Gun was only in effect for one year, and this was the result in 1971. A 14 to 1 kill ratio for the Navy pilots, while the Air Force still stayed at 2 to 1. So here's the thing. Uh, for the Air Force, the Air Force generally likes those breakthrough types of innovation. Air Force, we think the Air Force, they like the satellites, they like, um, they like dominance over the air. They don't want just uh, a significant advantage, they want dominance. So they're looking at the next generation aircraft, and that's what they're always looking at. The problem for Vietnam was they could not, you can't get the next generation aircraft out onto the battlefield in one year. That's one of the problems with breakthrough innovations, right? The Igor's talked about uh, artificial intelligence. He's talking about it's taking time, right? We, 1940, we, we're still, still not there yet. It takes a lot of time to break through innovations. Disruptive or, or revolutionary innovations take very little time. And that's the great benefit of doing disruptive innovation. And what the US Navy found out, and again, really, the two to one, the Navy, Air Force kept thinking they were doing break, uh, trying to do breakthrough. What they did was they, they uh, came up with uh, variants of the F-4, so it improved the distance of their missiles, it improved their thrust, so they had better F-4s throughout the Vietnam War, it just was not breakthrough innovations. It was really just, uh, in that case, it was uh, evolutionary innovation, trying to one out, one up the big 17s and big 21s. And so, um, Again, this is really not from a mathemat mathematician's perspective because I really don't want to scale your numbers. But if I do add one, one more axis, so if instead of thinking of it as a box, think of it as a cube now. If we have one more axis to offset potential, and I sort of alluded to this first, what innovations give you the highest offset potential? It's not the ones down here, right? The ones in green will not give you, right? They're just giving you slightly better performance over time. The ones that are giving you offset potential are greatly changed for really, what we saw in the top gun. It's these revolutionary breakthrough innovations. The problem again with breakthrough it takes a long time. Revolutionary takes a little bit of time. The problem with revolutionary uh, innovations, most of your uh, generals, most of your uh, C-suite executives for you, that doesn't appeal to them. Right? They like looking at things that, the bright shiny objects that come out of breakthrough innovations. And so that's, that's a cultural challenge that's uh, tough to beat, even in, in the military. And so this is what it would uh, look like if it was uh, in more scale, more reasonably scale. Now, on the other hand, if I, instead of offset potential, I look at these innovations and talk about probability success. I've already alluded to this, right? It's, the ones that have the highest public success, right, are in this green space, right? So when, when these CEOs, right, they write their self-help books on how to make it big, right, they're telling you to take risks, they're not telling you to take risks in this green space, because you should be getting 80, 90 percent in, in the sustaining and evolutionary space. Where you should be taking risks are the revolutionary breakthrough space. But breakthrough is tough, right? It's expensive, it takes lots of time. So who can do breakthrough innovations? Our government. 
right? The government doesn't, right? that's what Igor talked about, DARPA. DARPA does a great job at breakthrough. Unfortunately, he's talking about China as well, right? He's saying the threat actors, the vast of the threats, they're moving into AI, breakthrough space, for potentially future um, offensive cyber type capabilities. I am not too worried about that. From a personal perspective, it takes a long time. It costs a lot of money. If China says it's not to be on the world stage, let them spend money on this area. Because I'll come back to this in, in just a, in one second. So Igor said, don't believe the hype with, right? he, he said that, don't believe the hype in the AI. Well, Igor was giving a little bit of hype too, right? Because so he's saying we sort of need uh, AI on the defensive side to eventually combat AI on the offensive side. I, I would say don't believe too much of that hype. I am, uh, Confident, as you'll see by the end of my presentation, uh, doing revolutionary innovation, uh, cybersecurity on the revolutionary side is more than enough to uh, 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 combat what the current kind of future threats will be. And so again, this is a, a more representational look. Uh, if I add this probability success uh, access onto this uh, two-dimensional. Now, when I gave these talks before, I gave uh, a mathematical way of actually doing this. But when you just think about revolution and breakthrough successes, uh, it's majorly bagging. So if you're getting 20, 30 percent successes, then you're doing well. Uh, if you can get 40 percent, you get to 50 percent, you're doing very, very well. But it's tough. Again, if the notion of revolution innovations, a lot of people mischaracterize it, especially in the media. They say everything in these upper spaces is revolution. Anything that changes the world is a revolution. I'm using revolution in a specific sense. Revolts. Think about revolts. Uh, it's very dangerous. You do not have the capability, the capacity, uh, the training. Right, General Washington, his army was terrible. We had to get, he had to uh, get support from Prussia. He had to get support from France. All the generals um, who have statues at West Point, they don't, most of them don't have American names. Right? Kukusko. Uh, these are guys who came over from other nations to help build the Continental Army. Um, and it's very dangerous. Now, if I had sound, um, for me, what's more telling is Star Wars. Right? Star Wars, uh, we are led to believe through Star Wars that revolutions are easy. Right? Star Wars Episode 4, Star Wars Episode 6, Star Wars Episode 1. Uh, Road one, right? We are led to believe through Hollywood that revolutions are easy and uh, uh, folks who revolt, uh, especially every good cause, will take over and win. Uh, but see, my favorite movie was not, was not that. my favorite movie was Star Wars uh, Five, right? Star Wars Five: The Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back is telling for me because they are not going to fight the revolutionary. Right, these revolts one at a time. Right? They're not going to take you. They bring out the Death Star. They bring out the Death Star with some breakthrough innovation. Right? It takes a lot of time. Right? They're still building it when, when, right? and, uh, as the, uh, the revolutionary, the, rebel, the rebels are going to try to take it out with uh, the back door that's uh, embedded into the Death Star. We don't need back doors, right? They already exist. Um, and so, for, if you understand this notion of Star Wars, right, this, what the Emperor is doing is he's not going to take care of these revolutionaries, these rebels one at a time. He's going to destroy whole planets uh, to take care of that problem. Uh, and that's very effective, right? If you get rid of the whole planet here, all the rebels are gone. Now, another way of looking at this, if those analogies don't work for you, it's over a timeline. So again, it's not that there's no innovation taking place in the evolution of sustaining environment. They do take place. It's just at a slower rate. Uh, because really, all they're really doing is one update your next competitor. So there is an innovation that takes place, it just takes place at a slower rate. So breakthrough innovations, right? It jumps off the curve. That's what we can visualize, right? It's a breakthrough innovation, uh, high tech, uh, costs lots of money, takes lots of time, but it's jumping off the curve. And if it's successful, right? If it's successful, it gets the entire curve up. It moves that entire curve. But what about this notion of revolutionary innovation? <laughs> How can you have a low-tech, cheaper, right, 
uh, either idea, innovation, uh, that, that can compete against the green space, this evolutionary state? How can you compete against the, uh, the big three automakers? How can you compete against the Microsoft? How can you compete against Cisco? Um, well, amazingly, uh, there's a couple of researchers, um, one from Stanford University and one from Harvard Business School, uh, that uh, they study, uh, Shonda Brown and Kathy Eisenhart, they, they study really how these revolution innovations appeal really to small markets. And in the case of these hacker conferences, it appeals to the individual, right? The individual hacker who's finding these zero-day vulnerabilities, the individual hacker who's finding the fix to it, or the remedy for it, right, the CVEs, that are so much, right? it's for the individual initially. And so that's where it's, it's focused on, it's usually for the individual. And again, I can give examples after examples, right, IBM versus Apple. IBM focused on mainframe computers back in the uh, 70s, 80s, right, Apple came along, uh, focused on the personal computer, a lot cheaper. Now, someone asked me a question, right? Yeah, yeah, we know about right, this notion of disruptive innovations. Uh, someone asked me in one of the talks, does it happen in current day life? And I said, yeah, it happens in current day life. Right? How many people still have a Blackberry in their pockets? Very few, right? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, when you read, like Christian said about innovation, yeah. you know, and how you have these uh, market dominating you know, vendors who are disrupted by whoever they have to retreat up. Yes. That seems like what the security industry is doing now because you have attackers who are finding cheap ways to break in. Yeah. And as these vendors are trying to figure out a way to defend against these attackers, it's just getting more expensive. So my, I guess my question is, do you observe an opportunity for kind of blue team oriented vendors to come in and actually provide uh, solutions to this market where big vendors appear to be surrendering to the attackers because their products are just too expensive for the small business. Yeah, I, th I think we had one talk today. I think it might be Amy's and JJ's. They were talking about purple teams. Were you talking about purple teams coming in? Uh, tax simulation. Yeah, were you talking about purple teams? Someone, someone this morning was talking about I purple think teams. I yeah, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of purple teams. Don't, don't just do a red team, right? It's, it's so limiting. Uh, do a purple team. Are you talking about blue teams, uh, blue and red teams uh, improving the space? I am, I am actually hopeful. Uh, it's true that because of this, now if, if you don't have Greg Christensen, he's actually going to a much, much bigger problem. He's saying this space right here, once you're successful on this green line, once you're, once you're on the green line, you're, uh, you're, they argue you are right for being disrupted again by a different uh, vendor, as you mentioned, doing something faster, doing something cheaper, doing something that's not being looked at by that bigger company now, that's now on the green space. You notice on the green space, it doesn't continue to go up. You notice that on the revolutionary space, it doesn't continue to go up. That's deliberate. Because usually when the, so if we think about the revolutionaries in a real sense, when George Washington, right, kicked the British out, was our form of government better than the British? Not initially, right? Not initially. If you study history, the first eight years, General Washington's presidency, that's probably when the British should have attacked again. They waited until 1812, which was too late. Because then, right, 1812 was a lot further down the road. Um, the U.S. got better. Our Navy got better. They got bigger. For one thing, they got bigger. And we got support from, much more support from the French. Uh, so when you're getting onto this green space, very rarely does in a, uh, disruptive or revolutionary innovation rarely go above beyond it. Because if we think about it from a real life perspective, um, revolutionaries who succeed, they take over the government, but they have limited government capabilities. They're usually worse off. <laughs> the, the country is usually worse off when a revolutionary takes over, at least for the first few years. And that's why there's usually another revolution that takes place, because the same types of fraud, same types of corruption get blamed on those governments. That's why history is great, right? History. <laughs> We learn a lot of history at West Point. But if you apply this history, um, what, the, what these researchers actually found, like Shauna Brown and, and Kathleen uh, uh, Eisenbach, what they found out is very rare that they exceed the capabilities. It just, 
you're, you're on the green line once you're, once you're a revolutionary success. And that's why, as the question was earlier, that's why it's ripe again for another disruptive. Um, uh, and, and, a, and a classic example of that, especially Christians and Bauer, they use the disk drive uh, industry. So if you, th if you think about computing power of uh, however two years, you essentially get double computing power, which is why we get all these vendors that do great one year, and then to their on top of the industry, right through this green space, for two years, and someone undercuts them because they can get something cheaper twice the, twice the power. And, and it continues on and on. And the amazing thing is, even in the auto industry, um, uh, IBM versus Apple, I'm sorry, uh, GM, Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, Honda. What caused the, what caused the Japanese automakers to rise in prominence in the US? 1979? Gas yes, prices, right? We had the uh, Iranian hostages until we uh, embargoed no more, no more gas from Iran. So huge, we might be seeing a lot of that with the Korean situation going on. But uh, uh, who has disrupted Honda and Toyota? They're still disrupting them right now. It's the Korean companies. Uh, Hyundai, uh, the Kia, this really one company, Hyundai, Kia. Uh, they sort of disruptive Honda and Toyota on the Quality scale. Uh, they were doing it more on quality. Well, look, 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 look what happened. Toyota and Honda, they got into the green line, they started building big, bigger cars, right? Less gas efficient, but bigger, because that appealed to what Americans want. The South Korean companies, um, Hyundai and Kia, there's another company, Daibu, uh, they focused again on smaller markets, smaller cars. And Lo and behold, they sort of disruptive. Uh, to, who's who's disrupting the Korean companies? It's still happening. It's amazing. And please don't tell me Tesla. Someone always tells me Tes Tesla's. Come on, they're on the they're on the breakthrough. Right, long lead times. So expensive. I do. Yeah, there's two companies. Uh, uh, Tata out of India. Uh, again, uh, they might do it. Uh, unfortunately, they bought up Jaguar, which is strange, right? Yeah, that's not a good disruptive way of. Uh, they wanted to go into the electric market. And then in China, there's a car, a car company called Cherry. And they are focused primarily on the low end. Um, uh, who knows if they'll do it? Uh, history, is, theoretically, it's tough to do. But history tells us it happens over and over again. Uh, but I can give you examples, again, it's not that they succeed all the time, it's that they fail most of the time, right? These notions of breakthrough and revolutionary innovations Again, major league batting average is more like this. And I give you, I give you examples: sports, TV shows, right? There. Does anyone want to test me on it? Does anyone need something out? Right, TV, right? TV, TV shows. Um, well, actually, I'm just going to movies because I think it's more. movies. Who remembers the Blair Witch Project? Right, that's disruptive innovation, right? They, they did a horror movie, shot on a oh, what was it, a video cam, and. Was a blockbuster hit, right? Guess what happened when they tried to do Blur Witch 2? Well, they, they, exactly, they moved it into the green space. And so it bombed because it, it, they were expecting something disruptive, but it was back in the green space. They didn't do it too well. Um, uh, again, as a, as a movie fan, right, I, I, I'm a big fan of the action movies, so it's, uh, especially with me, and I do like the Mission Impossible stuff, right? Breakthrough, right? All the high tech CGI, all that stuff. And again, high tech stuff, uh, but again, tends to uh, take long, long time. Uh, now, the Blair Witch, again, that's the revolutionary space. Very, it shot in like three months, very cheap to do. Now, getting to my talk now, really, uh, so the notion of actually doing um, cybersecurity that both works. External hackers as well as the internal threats. And again, what I'm really talking about is, is using a honeypot. And really when I was researching this, I was thinking about seeding a honeypot with bad honey. And the interesting thing was I found this clip. Uh, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to hear it, but uh, you don't really need to hear it. You see this pair. You actually don't even need to see it, right? If you, if you, if you do a Google search for, for uh, mad honey, this is the first uh, thing that pops up. And, yeah, the sound is off. But there's a baron in Turkey that apparently ingested honey 
from a rhododendron plant, and it was hallucinogenic, and it causes the bear to get like uh, apparently the bear is, is uh, causing too much memory problems for, for this plant. But this bear is just right being dazed out. <laughs> so, so I changed my the uh, my talk to I'll exit this. Thing. Yeah, it's, it's the too much memory. So, so if you can imagine this bear, this bear comes just to the day's down. Um, and, and so we actually had a few talks this morning, right? Vince and I talked about uh, honey pots. We had uh, a few other folks talk about honey pots as a way to, um, as a cyber defense tool, uh, to, I wouldn't really say protect the network, but as an element of cyber defense. Uh, the, what I'm really advocating the honeypot is really for, for the US government as against the advanced persistent threats. Because we know that advanced persistent threats, particularly China and Russia, they're after the intelligence. So if you look at the Joint Strike Fighter, Strike and Resemblance, the Chinese version, the current Joint Strike Fighter, yeah, they, they took the blueprints, they got the plans uh, from Boeing and all the other contractors. If you take a look at satellite, satellite technology, China, India, uh, they've gotten a lot of technology from NASA, and that happens. And so I'm advocating that as a cyber defense tool, right? So how do I actually revolutionize it? We already know about honeypots. I'm talking about seeding, right? In this case, seeding a honeypot. Uh, I'm just going to go straight from here instead of uh, working on this slideshow. And, and this is where I get into the demo or, or look into just how Walrus talk can go completely downhill in, in a few minutes. Um, anyone want to be a co-conspirator with me and author a paper? That's why I was hoping to get some high school students. Do you want to co-author a paper with me? Just shout your name out. Shout your name out. I'll, be a, I'll let you be a co-author. Co I'll let you be the head author. I'll let the lead author. Shout your name out. Roy G. Bid. Roy? <laughs> Roy G? Yeah. Last name? Bid. B I B. D I B. Uh, anyone else want to be a co author? John Depp. John D E P? Yep. D E P. I'll put mine on here as well. And, and that's how long it takes. <laughs> that's as long as it takes <laughs> to generate <laughs> two seconds, right? Or less than a second. To generate a talk or paper called Natural Algebras by Roy G. Bibb, John Depp, and Cozy Bank. And, and this is very mathematical. Let E uh, upper upper be <laughs> arbitrary. Now, here's the interesting thing about these papers, right? I got this from uh, it's called a math paper generator. Just Google that, I'll come up. Uh, the original paper generator, it's actually a, it's a, a, a science and computing uh, information generators. Uh, these three MIT students generated this, uh, this uh, code that allowed them to generate papers like these. And the amazing thing is the graphs. If you look at these, it, these papers got accepted into referee conferences. A number of the papers got published in IEEE Publications, right? I truly believe, you know, that's the that's the granddaddy of the um, computing science field for publication, and they got published with these fake papers. Where you can only take them. Like, like, and the, the amazing thing is, is the SDI generator isn't working for me right now, so I already uh, I already rehearsed that one. So at least I got the match in error. The amazing thing is, uh, let's see here, right? These are right, the amazing. It's amazing how they do the graphs here. They're just, it looks real. <laughs> it sounds real too, right? If you've attended some of these talks and had no idea what the speaker is talking about, yeah, just read these papers, that's, that's what it's like. <laughs> but the amazing thing is these citations. These citations. <laughs> the way they... So, John Depp, you have, we, I just gave you another paper. Oh. See, it's the citation. Oh, even more. Roy Bibb, you got... You, you, we co-authored another paper. Right, we call it another paper. Right, there's a lot of self-citation that go on in the academic field. Right, I'm guilty of it too. Uh, so this is actually very realistic. And so if you can see a honeypot, particularly if you're the U.S. government, if you're the NSA, if you're the Department of Defense, right, if you're a high-tech company, 
if you're Boeing, if you're Raytheon, if you're a company that has a lot of high-tech secrets, and you want to seed a honeypot with a lot of irrelevant, irrelevant information, right, especially it's China, right, advanced persistent threat, I actually got this from a, I'm not going to give out any classified information, right, I can either confirm or deny any of this happened, I got this from a Shmukhan talk, one of the speakers said, the, the, um, the advanced persistent threat name was originally given to China uh, back in the 1990s when uh, President Obama uh, was in administration. And it was given because there was so much the Chinese were doing to hack into and steal technology, right? <laughs> that's, that's no wonder, right? So many things look the same uh, that Chinese have uh, right now. It looks like it's a US proper, like F-35, right? Chinese strike fighter. Um, but uh, does anyone else want to do a paper with me or a paper with someone else? Just, that's just how fast these um, generators do it. Anyone else want to co author a paper? Want to give me your name? Uh, me? Yeah, I'll, I'll just put I'll just some random words E, E, W, right? A, B, C, D. But this is how fast it is, right? Generating these papers. And so if you're, if you're concerned about seeing the honey plants taking a lot of effort, it really doesn't need to. Um, and the great thing about these papers is it doesn't have to be accurate. You just want the honey pot. You actually want the threat actor to get access to this honey pot and take away all this information. Because, right, there is a possibility of collision. There is a possibility that one of these papers actually turns out to be, right, it gives a golden nugget. But the odds are very low. And again, that's as quickly as it takes. Uh, of course, uh, there are some um, parameters specified in this in the programs, right? It's like 10 pages max. Um, uh, but you can see maybe, right, if you get an intern to do this, you can see maybe a thousand papers, right? And classify these top secret, right? Whatever code name you want to use. And place the honeypot where we think it's best. It can be placed at the most secure place or can place it outside, right? I would say place it both places because information at this point is wasting your threat actor's time. And that's, uh, and, and really, so people will come to me, so if you give this talk, and the Chinese and the Russians and the North Koreans now know that you're doing this, uh, doesn't it diminish the effect of the honeypot? Sure, but they're still doing it, right? They're calling advanced, persistent, persist, advanced, really, I, I disagree with. They are persistent threats, and so they're going to get access to the secrets eventually. So if you're like a Coca-Cola or Pepsi, this might not be for you, right? Coca-Cola just needs to protect its formula, right? If you're Pringles versus Frito-Lay, long, for the longest time, Pringles had a monopoly on making that shape fit into a can. Lay's tried for 20 years to replicate. They're doing it now, right, with that Lay's can? To get, they could never... They could never, for as big a budget as Lay's was, compared to Pringles, they could never get the chip to be in that shape to put in the can. It only was maybe what, six years ago, seven years ago. Right? Apparently they didn't want to buy Pringles out, so they had to spend a lot of R&D budget on that. But again, if you're, a, if you're a tech company and you're getting hacked a lot and you're seeing a lot of outflow of data, um, that's why I recommend sort of the honeypot and seeding it with this type of Mad honey. Right, it's not bad honey. I'm going to give a talk in the future. Bad honey is when you give them stuff that's, that kills them, right? Bad honey. There is bad honey out there. When I did the Google search for bad honey is stuff that will kill you. Mad honey is stuff that will keep you occupied, keep you dazed, keep you confused, and then keep your wheels spinning. And that's, I think that's what uh, our government needs. Uh, uh, have we done it before? I mean, Yeah, so in case the internet didn't work, they told me to have backups, so that's my backup. Uh, everyone I actually did a paper with, I co-authored a paper with, I actually introduced this to them, so, so they always get a plus paper. I always, I always learned these papers across my uh, office space whenever cadets would come to office instruction. Hey, look at this paper I wrote. And I tell them, oh, it's fake. Wanna, I'll, I'll, you you co-author with me on another paper, I'll, I'll generate in two minutes. That was probably not a good thing to tell cadets. So. My experience is uh, two years, they just published it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, 
So managers came from the Army Cyber Suit then, and two years to publish a paper. And that's, that's on the academic track. That's, uh, that's pretty fast. That's, usually these cyber papers go faster than normal. Usually it's like three to five years to get something published, even if after it's been peer reviewed, so it's, it's tough. Um, so really, how do you best protect cyberspace? Uh, well, I think the NSA resides mostly in the security space, right? If you talk to these NSA guys, the guys from SNAP, they're former NSA guys, I like talking because right, they're always thinking of these very extensive, very high-tech ways uh, thwarting them, it's either through offensive or defensive capabilities. Uh, now, sometimes you'll get a kernel's nugget that's like, ooh, that's, that's pretty cool. You guys, you guys did it in a cheap and fast way, right? We had, we had um, Grant, the high school student, talk, he gave an illusion to Stuxnet, right? Again, I can either confirm or deny Stuxnet was a U.S. <laughs> uh, zero-day vulnerability, but uh, I read Dark Territory, and in Dark Territory, it tells us how Stuxnet was not very advanced, right? And Stuxnet, if you don't know, it, it took down one of the suspected Iranian nuclear processing facilities, which the U.S. thought was building right, nuclear bombs. And I would say Stuxnet was, was elegant. It was not sophisticated. Um, and that very similar to most of the talks that we've heard, at least I've heard all day uh, today. It took down the centrifuge, it was essentially uh, SCADA, right? Stuxnet essentially took down a ICS SCADA type of facility, right? Industrial control system, right? Building. Nuclear, nuclear fission, right? A lot of centrifuges going on. Um, so what happened was that it, it, right, very sensitive equipment. It essentially uh, caused a turbine to spin faster and slower than they were supposed to. But what made it elegant, it wasn't sophisticated though, what made it elegant was that it spoofed the folks who were monitoring the ICS system. Um, right, they're getting feedback of saying that it's still spinning normal, right? Everything is, so what, that was to me elegant. It's, it spoofed the operators and gave it more time for this uh, facility to blow up. Um, now, because it was an ICS system, we generally think of IC, industrial control systems as standing up. So the other sophistication came along by, remember I talked about Mission Impossible? I think most successful innovations um, the slide up here is because I really want the NSA to start thinking of what the CIA can bring to them. Not if, if not just talk to them about what they, the CIA, CIA does for counterintelligence. Right? The honeypot is just one of the plethora of tools CIA has at its disposal. Unfortunately, the current CIA manual is classified, um, so I can't list out the, the tools, but if you look up counterintelligence properties on you know, Google, you'll see enough to where uh, you can make sense with, without even looking at the U.S. classified uh, counterintelligence tools. But if the NSA talks to CI folks and asks the CI folks uh, from CIA, what do you do when you think there's a spy in the U.S.? Right? Which is why I love, right, anyone who watched the Americans, or you sort of root for these Russian spies who have American lives. And of course, you're also rooting for the FBI counterintelligence guys at the same time as we're sort of but, but these, again, for example, partial mission floors, you can get smart, right? That's the, that's the, uh, that's the ultimate, I guess, in, in, in uh, satire for, for, this, for this genre. But I think if the NSA uh, does more with the CIA, they'll get some insights into uh, cyber defense that they haven't thought about because uh, they're focusing on this high-tech space, the high-tech um, breakthrough, breakthrough space. Now, um, that's it for my talk. Now, I do want to thank, really, Eric, Dallas, Michael, John. Kevin is the one that approved the talk, so I really want to thank Kevin. Uh, but I would encourage everyone here to try to give a talk as well. Uh, uh, I think a number of folks said that, uh, if, if for nothing else here at B-Sides, the speaker dinner last night was outstanding. Uh, ask the folks who are there. Uh, this is one of the best speaker dinners I have had, and uh, it's hard to wake up this morning. Uh, uh, but the, the uh, B-Sides uh, KC team did a great job, uh, really, for the speakers who welcome this year. And really, for really all folks in the, uh, in the uh, lifeguard shirts, I guess, in the, uh, 
Hi, just give a thanks, thanks out to them, because without them, we wouldn't have a program here. And I also would like to give a plug, because the dinner was so great, I want to give a plug for my next talk. So for next year, hopefully, uh, uh, my talk will be, I've learned time travel, and it's fun. That's, that's the, my first uh, iteration of the title. I normally go through like 10 iterations of title changes, but that's, that's uh, hopefully, I can come back next year, and that's going to talk. And, and here's the last slide. Do honey traps really work, in, really work in real life? Can anyone tell me what a picture of that is? Uh, yeah, well, most people, I don't have my build, so, uh, right, I was hoping most people would say it's, that's the U.S. Station, right? It looks a whole lot, and then I blow, this is my last full, right, it's got a Russian flag on it. This is the, anyone can read this really? It, I think it reads the Baron, or Baron, it was the Russian space shuttle. Uh, looks a whole lot like the U.S. Space Shuttle, right? Purportedly, the CIA, because they knew the space race was still going on, right? Most people said the U.S. won the space race. That was only because we got to the moon first, right? The Russians were kicking, <laughs> right? The Russians were winning enough until we got to the moon. Uh, and so the Russians back in the 70s and 80s still wanted to beat us in space. And, and uh, purportedly a CIA agent um, either fed a Russian agent or a double agent or a spy uh, false information. He essentially gave the Russians the initial designs, the initial, what they knew would fail, right? They gave them the initial heat shield design, and they found that that would fail. Well, let's pass this over to the Russians. And so somehow the Russians got a hold of this, and so the station looks a whole lot like ours, right? They, they, got, the, uh, they got the diagnostics and the schematics somehow, it looks very similar. Uh, but most folks would have said, and it never flew. Uh, it never flew price, right? Her stroke uh, took over. And I think SDI, right? Uh, SDI is probably another uh, use of deception. Uh, deception, I think, is a great use of revolutionary types of innovation, right? If we can fake our way into our opponents thinking that we're more capable or right, we're, we're doing things, or we're at the, at these fake math and cease. Is let them let the, let the threat actors right have mad honey. Let them play around with this. Let them translate it. Let them figure out if it's real. And we just say, hey, it can, I can either confirm or not. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, another example. I think a great uh, one, uh, real life of how uh, honey pot uh, actually worked. And uh, with that, I take to my last slide is. I think the, eh, this is just a filler slide. I, I actually do want to talk about this, right? It's what the Russians have been doing better. And again, it starts with Estonia, the first cyber attack on the world. Russia attacked Estonia, uh, had a cadet. That was back in 2007, the very first cyber attack on a nation. Happened again in Crimea. Uh, the interesting thing with the current conflict in Ukraine, I can hear a lot of cyber attacks. Uh, taking place on the Russian side. I heard lots of attacks taking place were anonymous against Russia. That was kind of interesting. Because the Russian modus operandi, it seems like, is they're using cyber as their initial, the Russian is using cyber as their initial attack base. And so that is concerned not only for me, but if, if you're particularly with the Department of Defense, uh, NSA, uh, that is going to be the initial ones you're probably going to see. Initial indicators, initial threats that we see. And so with that, I'm out of time. Um, I'd love to answer more questions, talk about honeypots, talk about uh, disruptive innovations, because that's sort of my uh, forte. I like that. Thinking of other ways where disruptive innovations actually uh, do make their ways into mainstream, mainstream culture and make, make noise to success. Um, hopefully, you can give a, a feedback to the conference organizers in my presentations and anything else. Uh, and with that, I will close out the talk and get us ready for prizes. Thank you very much.